Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Todd Eisman. I'm the Vice President of Business Development here at Neoscope. For those new to Neoscope, I just wanted to give you a bit of context here really quick. For the past 15 years, Neoscope has been a leading MSP that focuses on managed IT solutions and enterprise security for businesses, primarily in the New England area. Uh, we typically work with companies in two capacities, the first being companies that already have their own internal IT team in place. We simply are happy to work in this scenario alongside or with your internal staff to help you manage your IT and security needs. Whereas the second capacity is for companies that do not have an internal IT team in which they're simply completely outsourcing their IT and security needs directly to us. So two capacities, whether you have an internal staff or not, we're happy to help you out with your IT and security needs. Uh, today, we are joined by Neoscope's Chief Information Security Officer, Craig Taylor. Craig is a 25-year veteran of cybersecurity and the CISO at Neoscope. Today, we'll be talking about Neoscope's client, the City of Portsmouth. So just real quick about the City of Portsmouth and our relationship about three years ago. The City of Port Portsmouth was in a pretty, pretty dark and difficult spot because of a very serious virus outbreak. At that point, uh, being neighbors, Neoscope and City of Portsmouth's IT director, Alan Brady, got together. And thankfully, we were quickly able to bring stability back to the City of Portsmouth by con containing and, and literally completely eradicating the virus outbreak, which was obviously fantastic news for the city. Over the next three years, Alan and Neoscope put in a in-depth defense program to protect the city and its residents for any future cyber attacks. And some of those measures helped actually carry through the work from home or the COVID-19 era that we're uh, all well aware of right now. So once again, we appreciate everyone joining us today. We'll have some time at the end of the presentation so you can ask questions. Feel free to use the chat feature or the question uh, widget here within the console. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Craig. So, Craig, take it away. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that introduction, and you're absolutely right. Three years ago, the city was in a very difficult and dark place, and uh, we were rapidly able to get them out of that situation and then build for a future where it wouldn't happen again. And so what the presentation or webinar today is all about are the eight steps to building a robust defense in depth cybersecurity program for your small to medium sized business using the city of Portsmouth as an example. So let's get started with a number of things. The uh, overview or agenda of today is we're going to do a little bit of an introduction of Craig, me and Cyberhoot. What do we um, what do we do? How do we do it? And how do we have the right to explain cybersecurity programs to you? And we'll give you a little bit of a background on cybersecurity today, including who's attacking our businesses and what's their motivation? Why are they attacking us? Secondly, we're going to cover why small to medium sized businesses are attacked 15 times more often than smaller and larger companies. Then we'll go into the example of the city of Portsmouth. Where were they three years ago? What measures are in place in the city today? and which of those measures helped with both the pandemic and post-pandemic success uh, in securing their environment. We'll sum it all up with the eight steps to a cybersecurity program for you, and we'll entertain questions at the end. So, who's Craig Taylor in Neoscope? Well, Craig has worked, uh, I've worked for many years in cybersecurity. I was working in cyber before there was an internet as you all know it today. There was no World Wide Web. I've worked at companies like uh, Secure Computing, a firewall manufacturer in the early mid-90s, a multinational firm called Computer Sciences Corporation for 15 years in their web hosting division before there was Amazon Web Services, uh, serving up companies like DuPont, Bose, Citizens Bank, those sorts of companies, their audit, uh, auditing that they did of us as we hosted their website online in the early 2000s through 2015. Vistaprint, a global manufacturer of print Chase Payment Tech, a large you know, multinational banking institution in their uh, payment card in, uh, division. Cyberhoot, I'm the co-founder of Cyberhoot, which is a learning management system used by Neoscope and many of its clients, as well as the city of Portsmouth, by the way. And I am a virtual or chief information security officer at Neoscope. 
and many of its clients throughout New England. So I bring these expertise to Neoscope and its clients to help secure them, one of which is the city of Portsmouth. So let's move into a little bit of a bootstrapping on cybersecurity, shall we? Who's attacking us and why? And this image sort of goes through the gamut of hackers. You've got black hat hacking for themselves, gray hat in the middle, white hat helping companies. I would consider myself not even a white hat hacker, more of a, a, a cyber program development person, script kiddies, uh, nation states, and organized crime. Uh, let's get into the specifics though. Script kiddies are out there hacking our companies for fun and notoriety. If you remember the war games in 1980 or somewhere around there, some kids in their parents' basement were hacking into the Pentagon, looking for the space shuttle plans, trying to get some notoriety over their hacking skills, not to cause problems or extort money, but to become famous. They are not the company, the, the folks that I worry the most about. I worry the most about this group, organized crime. In the last 10 to 15 years, organized crime has become the biggest hacking uh, force to be reckoned with among small to medium sized businesses as well as large enterprises as well. They are hacking for money. They have realized it's a lot harder to hack in the real world or to make off with goods and services, uh, contraband, uh, trafficking, uh, because there's so many cameras, there's so much physical security now. Online, it's a relatively uh, easier to hide your tracks, to hack with impunity, to hack through multiple countries, multiple languages and not get caught. So organized crime is really turning to the internet to hack all of our companies. We need to be ready for them. Nation states are also a hacking organization or entity that you need to know about, and they're hacking for a global advantage. If you think about the U.S., they hack into co companies all over the world for advantages to U.S. businesses. The same is true of Israel, uh, China, Russia, even Iran. Those are some of the big powerhouses that are hacking uh, for both, both a global advantage, or in the case of North Korea, for the ability to cause trauma and destruction in our, in our, our economies. The fourth group is hacktivists. We just came through a national election in the United States, and there was a lot of political hacking and uh, disinformation and, and all sorts of things, but hacktivists hack not just for politics. They hack for a social cause too. It could be mining or fishing or forestry. If you have uh, a company that is extracting resources from this earth, someone's upset about it, and they're probably asking hacktivists to fight for that goal or objective to, uh, to uh, limit the damage that your company may or may not do in their perception. I'm not making any comment about any of those industries uh, doing those things. I'm sure there's lots of responsible um, uh, you know, farming activity that is sustainable as well. So, um, but these are the main groups. If you look at the 2020 Verizon data breach uh, statistics, this is a con uh, database that has all of the statistics of all the breaches that Verizon can get their hands on. And they participate with a number of national and international organizations to collect that data, as well as perform forensics of their own. They have a service division that goes in and looks at breaches and helps contain, eradicate, recover, and revise from those. So they collect all this data. They have by far the largest database. They did a multi-relational analysis of who's attacking for the breaches that they see. And these are the numbers that they came back with. 6% are script kiddies, 50% is organized crime, 12% is nation states, and if I get out of the way, 4% is hacktivists. So what does that mean? That doesn't add up to 100%. Uh, Who's the other organization? And for them, it's insiders. There are two types of insiders, I'll let you know, that are accidentally causing problems in our organization. They're not really attacking us. Uh, but there are also malicious actors inside our organization. So there's two groups, those that make a mistake Maybe they email all the W-2s to the president of the company, but it's not the president, it's the hacker. And now we have an identity theft uh, fiasco as what happened at Seagate, if you ever Google that. Uh, or it could be a malicious actor taking the recipe for Coke and selling it to Pepsi on the black market for their personal gain. Both of those represent about 28% of the breaches that were identified in the Verizon data breach. Knowing your adversary and knowing what their motivations are helps you protect your company because you may not have a lot of intellectual property that could be sold. You may have a bunch of money in the bank which would be targeted by uh, organized crime. Or you might have some really strategic national uh, security based uh, intellectual property that a nation state might want to get her, their hands on. 
you need to do different things to protect against those adversaries. So moving beyond who's attacking us, let's talk a little bit about the growth in cybercrime and why we all need to pay attention as small to medium sized business owners. Over the last 10 years, from 2012, we've seen an increase in attacks against SMBs from an average in 2012 of 18% to a high of 65% last year. So we are very firmly in the SMB space in the crosshairs of those attackers on that previous slide. Verizon's multi-database analysis shows that organizations with 11 employees to 100 are 15 times more likely to be attacked successfully than larger or smaller companies. So it really puts it, grounds us all to say, yes, we are the target as SMB owners. We need to take action authoritatively. We cannot be ostrich business owners and put our heads in the sands ignoring cybersecurity anymore. Or if we do, we will be breached and we will have negative consequences for that. So let's ask the question, and I want you to think on your own as we go through these uh, this presentation, this webinar, what do you think the reasons why those smaller to medium sized businesses are attacked successfully so often? What is it about those companies that puts them at risk? I'm of course going to give you the answers, but I want you to think about it first. So the first thing that I come up with is they have no time. Most employees in an SMB wear multiple hats and none of them is a cybersecurity hat. So they're not putting any time towards cybersecurity best practices or addressing weaknesses in their business. They're just hoping that they're too small to be attacked. That's a well-known fallacy though, as you see from the Verizon data breach report. They don't have much money. You know, I've worked at a lot of companies, Fortune 1000 and banks. Banks would write a check for any risk that they found in their organization or in their technology and they would address it with whatever technical or process or people training requirements were necessary to eliminate that risk. That is not true in small to medium sized businesses. F money is tight and so you need to be very careful where you spend your money. Do you spend it on marketing? Do you spend it on salaries? Do you spend it on cyber insurance? You know, you need to spend something on cyber security protection but you need to know which protections are the most valuable. And when we get into that later in this presentation, you're gonna see some low hanging fruit that is relatively low cost that gives you a lot of bang for every dollar you spend. So let's pay attention as time goes through this presentation on those items. Furthermore, SMBs are attacked because when they hire people fresh out of college or high school or uh, wherever that might be, they don't come with cybersecurity skills. My children learn about the importance of cyber bullying, not doing that, of not sexting, of not um, fudging their grades or, or cheating or plagiarizing work online. Those are all important skills and, and, and bits of computer literacy that are important, but they've had zero training on password hygiene and no training on social, social engineering or how to spot and avoid phishing attacks. So when you hire my son or daughter or anybody out of the educational system, I don't care if you're in a, uh, a Ivy League school or otherwise, there's really an enormous gap in cybersecurity knowledge of, of people graduating. It's just expected that you self-teach yourself these things, but that's not how it works. You need to be taught. And so the employees that you hire, they come as novices. And unfortunately, the next reason you're attacked is because you don't address it with awareness training and governance policies. Many SMBs do not do awareness training like we're doing today here or as an ongoing monthly activity to help their employees understand the attacks they're up against and how to avoid them. Finally, they don't have a security lead at these SMBs who can look at, you know, wearing that cyber hat. So somebody wears a hat role, cybersecurity role, but because cybersecurity is one of the least um, uh, there are so few practitioners of cybersecurity in the U.S. I think the stat was there was uh, basically one million unfulfilled cybersecurity jobs open in 2015-ish, and that's grown to three million in the last uh, article I read uh, of jobs that could be people, companies would be willing to hire some competent cybersecurity professional into, but they can't find them. So it's very difficult, even if you wanted to hire for that role, it's very difficult to find someone to fit it. 
feed it. And that's why crooks and hackers target the SMBs because they just are basically fish in a barrel. They're not doing enough to secure their environment. Now there is one more reason and I'll give you a quick example. Target was breached because of not their own cybersecurity mistakes, but the HVAC vendor who had remote access to all of their stores across the United States. The hackers knew this, broke into the HVAC vendor, rode the VPN straight into every store, right into their payment terminals, and stole 70 million credit cards. So your SMB, you may not have lots of money, you may not have intellectual property, you may not have something that you think a hacker would want, but keep in mind, you might have access to companies that do. And so you might be targeted for that reason as well. Switching gears. We've covered what the hackers out there are, who they are, what their general groupings are, what their motivations are on one hand. On the other hand, we've talked about why SMBs are so often targeted. And those SMBs can be include uh, government agencies like cities, towns, and municipalities. And we're going to switch gears now and go to a real world example that Neoscope has firsthand experience helping through from a lot of technical debt and insecurities to a very robust environment today. So three years ago, you can see on your screen, the city was in pain. Why were they in pain? They were in a multi-week citywide EMITET ransomware infection and compromise. Their email systems were crashing multiple times a day. We're Alan Brady on the call today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. He has some other emergency to deal with. But were he on the call, he's told me in practicing these slides for today's presentation that he says the email systems were crashing multiple times an hour. It was ridiculous. They were in very, very difficult straits. The Emotet virus or the infection that they experienced quickly spread to all the nooks and crannies of the city environment because they had a flat network. They had unmanaged switches, which meant they couldn't see where the virus was spreading. They couldn't log in and validate whether a network or segment was protected. Uh, they just had to assume everything was compromised. Their staff had admin credentials across the city, and this may be the smoking gun of how the infection started by some phishing attack where someone clicked the link, downloaded a, ma a bit of malware, opened it with administrative credentials and had the rights to begin the infection and the encryption process across the city. Uh, we still don't have a root, root patient zero in this event uh, three years down the road. <clears throat> the city had never done a risk assessment, so they had finite budget to spend on cybersecurity, but they didn't know where to spend it, whether to spend it on technology, or on training, or on policies and process development. They really just didn't know. Um, there was no training for any employees. There was a lack of confidence, awareness, and productivity. Alan has relayed the message of staff tracking him down in the hallway, not necessarily in a panic, but very concerned about their desktop and an email they got that they think something's not right about it and maybe they were infected and maybe they needed their computer regenerated. It was kind of slow. To today, after three years of training, they just pass them in the hallway confidently saying, hey, I got this phishing attack, I deleted it, but here's the subject in case you want to alert or filter that out of other inboxes. You know, those employees at the city have gone from um, no confidence to confidence, from a lack of awareness to confident and secure and productive as well. They're not chasing Allen down, they're just dealing with their inbox as, you know, a normal daily activity. They had old, out-of-date cybersecurity policies that hadn't been touched in many years, and they, they needed they weren't really providing any utility or service to this to the employees. They did have antivirus, uh, but there was no anti-malware, like a malware bytes. There were no DNS protections, um, either at the desktop level with a, a Cisco umbrella solution or something that's built into Webroot is looking for zero-day attacks and some things that you can do in DNS to protect workstations. But also on the internet, anyone could pretend to be cityofportsmouth.com and send messages because there were no mail security records called SPF, DMARC, and DKIM. All right, uh, just doing a time check. Oh, we're good. No password manager was in place. So think about how many employees operate at a city. Without a password manager, it's a guarantee they're reusing their favorite passwords from all over the internet on city equipment. And that just makes it ripe for a email, business email compromise, the reuse of credentials if they're not two-factor authenticated, 
those sorts of things. So it's a really a risky situation to be in. And add to that, they were using just username and password on remote access. There was no two factor. So any breached password on LinkedIn in 2012 or Dropbox in 2015 or you name it, Yahoo in between, those credentials and those clear text passwords could have been attempted to log into the city with this uh, you know, email address of uh, cityofportsmouth.com. Finally, their PCI program was just starting out. They, they process credit cards at the city, but they do a really good job of it. Uh, they just need to be compliant with all of the standards that are there and be able to prove it. And so in the intervening three years, we've been able to capture the things they were doing already and prove that their program was compliant. So let's fast forward. Oh, wait, there's one more. Heavy technical debt. Really, at the end of the day, the city had been operating for many years with no documentation on their network. They didn't have uh, managed switches, so they couldn't see the traffic. There was no segmentation in the network. Uh, there was no help desk ticketing system where they could get support 24-7. There was just a lot of technical debt that had accumulated over time. So let's take a look at what Neoscope was called in to do and what was accomplished in the intervening three years. First of all, this is what a cyber incident response cycle looks like. Hopefully you get engaged before an event like this occurs and you're, you're doing a lot of your upfront heavy lifting in the preparation phase to uh, be able to detect and analyze attacks before they're successful and then occasionally contain or eradicate or recover if something gets through. And then do a post-incident activity response where you look at what actually got through and why and then fix it with a little more preparation. And it's a feedback loop. And hopefully this really eliminates the large events and keeps it down to, you know, a compromised workstation or uh, an email account of some kind. Uh, when the city of Portsmouth was called Neoscope in, you know, we spent the first two to three weeks deploying all kinds of defenses to contain and eradicate the virus that was there, to identify it. So we put out new anti-malware from Malwarebytes that had signatures that could identify Emotet and stop it from propagating. We removed admin access to the workstations to prevent a reinfection. And we immediately began awareness training, all in the first few weeks of, of, of Neoscope taking on the cyber security program and the compromise at the city of Portsmouth. And then over the intervening years, we implemented a lot of preparation, a lot of redundancy, a lot of technical debt was eliminated. And, uh, and, and we, we fast forward all the way to 2021. We're now engaged in uh, penetration testing, vulnerability scanning of the, of the city's systems and really taking it from a level three maturity on a five point scale to a four uh, maturity where they were at a zero before or maybe a one in some cases. So in 2018, we detected, analyzed, contained, and eradicated the virus in three weeks. We did those things. We started awareness training, as mentioned. In uh, 2019, we also did a risk assessment to identify and properly spend the finite time and money the city had to address security issues. One of the big projects that we did was a consolidation of physical servers to virtual servers. That provides so many benefits to uh, patching to testing patches before they go into production and really provides a more robust experience for the end users because they have more more resources available than on an individual server basis. We also started the long uh, uh, project which is still in, in progress of network segmentation of identifying the different networks and data sets within the city and segmenting them into you know if it's tax or or human resources or anything else. Uh, we wanted to keep those networks segmented and isolated from one another, no different than what you would do in a submarine, such that if a, you know, the hull is breached on a submarine in one of the network segments, you can close off that section and not sink the whole ship or the whole city. And uh, that's what we've been doing with network segmentation. It's the best analogy I have. Uh, but unfortunately, before that, it was a flat network. So one crack and everything flooded and, you know, the city was at danger of, of sinking. Into 2020, we, we started working more on preparation detection and analysis. We, we improved the PCI program. We reviewed and updated the cybersecurity policies. We adopted a, cl a cloud spam filtering solution, which provides a little bit more robust uh, filtering of their email, gets rid of some spam before it arrives. We enabled two-factor authentication for remote access and began the adoption process of a password manager. And this is all during COVID. 
Um, and into 2021, we've started fish testing. What we found is with the awareness training, employees have the requisite knowledge. They don't necessarily apply the requisite knowledge. So if, if you in your own program could do one thing, the lowest cost denominator is to do some training with your staff, but make sure you tag on fish testing if you can, because testing them means they begin to apply the knowledge that they learned. And finally, we're looking at pen testing and building DR sites for the city uh, as we speak now. We did an updated risk assessment and we performed some vulnerability scanning. So there's a synopsis, if you will, of where the city was how they moved forward and eliminated technical debt and consolidated things into virtual machines that did network segmentation, improved their technology, improved their process and procedures and their uh, policy governance of employees and adopted training and testing. But if you wanted to put it into words, here's the eight steps you should take to build your cybersecurity program at your small to medium sized business. First and foremost, do a risk assessment. You have finite time and money to spend on these things. You need to do them on the most, the hardest, the biggest risk, the most damaging risk, uh, costly risk that you face with the amount of time and money you have available so that you're not spending it on superfluous things. You wanna govern employees with cybersecurity policies. You could work with HR to get some of the uh, handbook policies put into cyber policies around acceptable use or password policies or information handling policies. You need to train your people on the types of attacks they're facing as well as test them to make sure they apply that knowledge. Then there's a number of technologies you need to put in place, which is first of all, taking away administrative rights to the desktop. Secondly, make sure you have all your anti-technologies in place, anti-spam, anti-virus, anti-malware, add on to that some DNS protections for zero day attacks and you're starting to build a good solid technology stack. Network segmentation is your friend. It may be difficult, it may be hard, but it is definitely worth the climb. Multi-factor authentication and a password manager are two super strong steps you can take to secure your environment from breaches. Um, that's, those are two steps. Do not overlook multi-factor and the adoption of a password manager. Finally, uh, you want to measure and report on everything. There's some pretty important books written about if you don't measure, you can't m improve. And really, this cyber program, any cyber program, has to improve over time. Otherwise, you can think of a cyber program as a canoe in a river. You're either paddling upstream, or if you're doing nothing and just status quo, you're going to be falling behind because the hackers are always improving. So you got to measure and report and then find opportunities for improvement. Now, as a special bonus, just like fire, flood, or life insurance, you need to add cyber insurance to your overall protection program for those catastrophic events that might occur, right? If you have, you know, a fender banner, you're probably going to pay for it yourself. But if you lose your car as a total write-off, hopefully you're safe and secure and you're not hurt, but your insurance is there to get you a new car to drive to work uh, next week, right? So that's what cyber insurance is. It's kind of a standard. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, here's the three pillars of an information security program in a in a overall that capture all eight of those steps that we just talked about. You've got the pillar of policies and process. You've got people to train, to govern, and to um, educate on the products that they're supposed to be using. Then you have a technology stack that protects your people and your technology when they forget their policy and their training and they still click on a link. That all sits on a risk management framework where you keep that up to date every one to two years, updating your risk management, tracking your most egregious and damaging risks and what your remediation plan is. And finally, you have this cyber insurance to back you up at the end of the day. So there you have it. That's the eight steps to building a cybersecurity program at your SMB or at your MSP or whoever you are. I wanna turn it over to Todd now because he's been collecting questions <coughs> for us. Uh, from the audience today. We had, I think, 30 or 40 people on this on this call today, if not more. And uh, Todd, do you have any questions for, for the audience in this recorded session? Yes, sir. Um, we've got seven, seven questions here. So um, I'll start from top to bottom here. So first is, is cyber, cyber insurance really worth it in your opinion? Cyber insurance is worth it because when you have that catastrophic event, you really need the extra help to recover from it, or you risk going out of business. Small to medium sized businesses don't have, you know, months of um, operational expenses, uh, dollars in the bank. You could be down for a day, 
You could maybe be down for a week, but could you be down for two or three weeks? Cyber insurance helps you get back up and running quickly, and it also provides the coverage for things like identity theft protection, legal uh, uh, problems that you might face, uh, and can you can hire a PR firm to help control the messaging around the breach because you know it's not always uh, SMB's fault. Hackers are devious and they just need to be right once. So you really do need all of these support and and, and uh, cyber insurance can provide that. Fantastic. Um, so second question here is, does Neoscope services stop at in production hardware, software and data? Or do you assist clients with hardware and data that are retiring or actually at end of life? Yes, yeah, so that's really an interesting part. That's a probably a foundational activity that Neoscope goes through with our clients. When we onboard a client, we do a thorough analysis of your hardware assets, your software assets, and we get the warranty information and the, the um, life of that hardware or software unit. So we're tracking the uh, end of life of software, end of life of hardware, of the warranty, and we're, we're really working with you to prioritize the replacement of that or the migration to supported software. Many times we find there's a lot of technical debt. Companies are still today running with, good, God forbid, a Windows XP machine, but there's still lots of Windows 7 and Server 2003 that's out there. It's no longer supported. It's putting you at critical risk to compromise, and we work through those processes to upgrade you to supported solutions and track the renewal of those things so that we can budget it over you know, if you have 15 laptops, we don't want to buy them all in one year. We want to budget five and five and five over three years. So we tr really try to work proactively with you to help you plan for that eventuality. Makes sense. Uh, a few more here. How often over the course of the year do you conduct uh, end, end user security awareness training for clients like City of Portsmouth? That's a great question. Uh, the City of Portsmouth had... Uh, has annual training that they do. They have onboarding training. No one gets an account onto the uh, network until they've watched three awareness videos and signed off on some paperwork and policies. And then they actually have a monthly cybersecurity awareness program that Neoscope rolls out to them uh, so that they learn all about those things we just covered, the hackers that are out there, what's their motivation, what are you watching out for from a social engineering, phishing attack, password management perspective to prevent the city from being breached to enable you to serve the citizens of Portsmouth? And so that monthly training has really been effective. It's been well received. Uh, we, we surveyed employees across the city of Portsmouth and 60% said they would miss out if they stopped getting these monthly trainings. So, the reality is, is the employees appreciate learning all about the cybersecurity skills they didn't know they didn't have, and uh, they're operating more confidently, productively, and securely uh, today with those trainings. Fantastic. All right. We've got three more um, that kind of encapsulate all of the, the questions that are being asked here. So for those that might be on a tight budget, um, is there an economical starting point that you might recommend? So if you could do nothing, I'm sorry, not nothing. If you had to choose from all the things we've talked about today to do one, two or three things, I would say the most economical starting point is to begin training your employees about their um, lack of cybersecurity skills. That's number one. Number two would be to turn on two-factor authentication on any internet enabled service or critical account, whether it's banking, email, VPN, that's important. The third would be to adopt a password manager. And this is one that costs money in an enterprise environment or in a business environment, but it's free for personal use. So you could adopt a LastPass as a personal user for free. You could adopt Dashlane or 1Password, any password manager, as long as you pick one and you learn it and use it personally. That's something you could do as an individual. And then the company should follow along down the road. But those are two or three things that are a great economical first starting point if you if you didn't have um, a larger bucket of money. At the very first opportunity, you should really spend the extra money to get the risk assessment done by a third party who is an expert in the, in the area of risk management to really help you put a roadmap together, to put on some mitigating controls on some of the risks you already face, and then 
prioritize things with your finite time and money so that you're really sure that you're spending your time and energies in the right places solving the right risks. That's what I would do. Well, that your answer actually segues perfectly into the next question, and it's up on the screen as well. Um, are there any risk assessment templates available on the internet that are, are uh, cost effective that you might recommend? So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you go to, um, if you were to search for cybersecurity risk assessment, I'm sure you'd find like the National Science Foundation has uh, 20 areas of concern around risk management from. And, and those 20 categories of risks are, you know, hardware assets, the risks to not knowing what hardware you have in your environment, then software assets, all the way through policy governance of employees, awareness training of employees, legislative compliance, like around privacy, or, um, you know, we, we have a lot of privacy legislation we have to comply with if we work internationally, GDPR, if we work within the US at CCPA, and every state has their own tools. So there are definitely standards out there, but how do you sort through it all is a bit of a challenge if you don't have any experience in this space. It's kind of hard to get done directly. What I can tell you is that the Neoscope has built in a 10 question high level cybersecurity maturity assessment. And you don't have to be uh, a, you know, a, a real technical person to complete it because it's paint by numbers. It asks you, do you train your employees? And it gives you five choices. I never train them through, I train, test, govern, um, remediate, and fish test them is, you know, level five maturity across 10 domains. And that gives you really a, a high level scorecard of where your small to medium sized business lives today. So if you want to do that assessment, just go to neoscope.com slash cyber, and you'll be able to take that assessment. It'll email you the results. Um, and of course, we would love to follow up with you on any needs that you might have that fall out of that. So that's one free online assessment that you can see right on your screen right now. Fantastic. All right. Last question. Um, what's one thing that most companies miss in their cybersecurity assessment or program that they should just be cognizant of? What's one thing they miss? Uh, I think I would reiterate the, the importance of fish testing your employees. If you're training them and you ask them uh, out loud, what is a, how do you spot a phishing uh, attack? They'll tell you and you'll be confident they know how to avoid that phishing attack. But do they apply the knowledge? My experience shows that unless you're testing your employees, they are not applying their knowledge and they're liable to click on something. And if they have the administrative rights, infect you with an emetet like virus, and then there's a world of hurt on your business. So I think one of the things that is often forgotten is to test employees after you've done some training. You don't have to test them every month, quarterly, semi-annual. My cyber experience, friends and I, uh, peer group, I have a vCISO peer group, they think that you know a couple of quarterly tests and then an annual is probably sufficient. Just to create that awareness that you may be tested at any time means every employee is looking at every phishing attack or every email to make sure it's not a phishing attack. And that can do wonders for your overall protection. The second thing is adopting that password manager. That alone can really improve productivity and security across your entire, your entire business. So those two things are probably big things that are underrated in the cybersecurity programs of the world. Uh, that's what I would recommend that you consider. All righty. Well, that's it for questions, Craig. I appreciate you walking us through this. Uh, for the folks that joined us and that are watching, we really, really appreciate you taking time to um, walk through things with us. As Craig mentioned, there's a couple things on your screen. If you'd like to take advantage of, uh, you feel free to jump on that cyber security assessment, neoscopeit.com slash cyber. Um, just a 10 question overview that might get you started. There's a lot of questions in here that, that um, you might be able to get a jump start on that, or feel free to reach out to Craig and I. We're happy to help you in any possible way. Um, we are gonna compile the rest of the questions and get back to folks and uh, we'll be following up with anyone. But if, if you need absolutely anything, don't hesitate, reach out to Craig and I, and we appreciate you coming out today. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone and happy uh, safe computing. <laughs> Take care.